Welcome to Woodbury Writes Podcast. I'm your host, Sandy Carlson. I'm here today with the co-authors of The American Way, a true story of Nazi escape, Superman, and Marilyn Monroe. Welcome to Helene Stepinski, the nationally best-selling author of three memoirs, Five Finger Discount, Murder in Matera, and Baby Plays Around. Helene regularly writes for the New York Times, and her work has appeared in the Washington Post, New York, Travel and Leisure, and dozens of other publications. She teaches at NYU and lives in Brooklyn. Bonnie Siegler is the founder and creative director of award-winning multidisciplinary graphic design studio, Eight and a Half. The author of Dear Client, a guide for people who work with creatives and signs of resistance, a history of protest in America. Bonnie has taught design in the graduate schools of Yale University and the School of Visual Arts for many years. She lives in Connecticut. Welcome, Helene and Bonnie, and thank you for joining us up here in Woodbury for a conversation about this brand new book coming out on Valentine's Day. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very curious. I, I Like I told you before, I read the book in two days and I would not be bothered by any sense of responsibility to the outside world because it is so compelling. And one of the questions that was on the back of my mind from the first page was, what did you do when you found the video of Marilyn Monroe after all the, uh, the film? We were blown away. We were so excited, both because it meant the story was true and also because it was really beautiful because the lighting was so good. It was a set, it was a movie set. So most home movies don't look so good, but this one looked incredible. Um, I talked to my grandfather the next day and I was very excited. We found it, we found it. And he said, of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> but that was years later, right? After, after all the stories? Yeah, I know heard of it my whole life but we finally found it and he was just like yeah it was over there somewhere like not having it was not an obstacle in his mind <laughs> that's great and you know and I when I read that part I thought of the three and a half inch floppies and the cds that we have in storage containers up and down the basement how did you get to watch that footage for the first time well my husband is a filmmaker so <laughs> We had, we put it on a reel to reel. So it was, you know, and then it stretched across and we watched it. We were too afraid to run it through a projector because it was kind of brittle, there were splices. So we just viewed it with a with a um, magnifying glass basically on the thing. We, we literally projected it one time because we were so afraid. And, but then we transferred it and now we don't project it at all anymore. Helene, did you get to see the, the footage in, uh, in its first form? Yeah, I mean, I didn't see it in the actual, the first time she showed it because she she found it years before she actually wanted to get a story written about it. She had kind of sat on it for a while. What was it like 10 years by? How long was it? Yeah, yeah. right. So she showed it to some friends, you know, at the time, I guess. And then when she met me and we decided I was going to write a story about it for the Times, um, I actually, I think I had to go to Connecticut, didn't I, to look at it? On my phone, like I showed the New York Times on my Oh, phone. maybe. Maybe that's what it was. We had lunch together, and she showed me on the phone. But then I did see it at your house eventually, you know. When I went to – she's got like a giant – she's a designer, obviously, so she's got this giant um, computer screen. And so she showed it to me on there, and that that was sort of like spectacular. You know, it's different when you see it on a phone, obviously. Um, and it's just so beautiful. Like she said, it's, it's really crisp, and it looks like it was shot yesterday – and it's just, the film is just really great film stock. And it's just really, really, really beautiful. And it's really saturated. The color is just really bright. And it looks like she's right there, you know, and he was, he was right, you know, he was only a few feet away from her. And, you know, these days you would never get that close to a celebrity, never mind, you know, at a film shoot. So it's really something special. And she knew it was something special. And so that's how that, that story in the Times came about. So she found me. And then, you know, one thing led to another. <laughs> That, that's this it's so it's so interesting you know um to find out that grandpa's fishing story is a real story he actually right uh, that, so that's that's amazing i'm just just curious you know one of the f fun things about your book are the notes i'm a little bit of a dork about the notes because they're they're a that's great that you love them I mean, not everybody does you know that's that's the good stuff yeah so so this is what i'm curious about from the point of view of research because this is I think what's so impressive about the book is the way the narrative just sings across the page. And it obviously comes from writers who know the city, know their material inside and out, because there's just no getting stuck in, in the facts. They just flow. 
But then you go back to page, oh, good old page 350, chapter three, Daredevil Reporter, Katia Baumeister Frenzel, an expert on the Romanisha's Cafe in Bohemian Life in 1920s Berlin, provided photographs, background, and other essential materials and documents, including George Zivier's book, The Romanisha Cafe. How do you find this stuff, you guys? How do you find the, the websites, the blogs, the boxes of magazines and comic books and the experts on these things that contributed to your, your understanding of the content? That particular one, you know, we were, Bonnie was the one who really pushed for us to go to Berlin. It was during the pandemic. And she was like, we need to go to Berlin and jump in here anytime, Bonnie. And I, I was just like, yeah, okay, whatever. We'll get there. <laughs> I didn't think we were ever going to go. And I was just sort of like, yes, I know to death. But yeah, okay, we'll go to, we'll go to Berlin. I mean, normally I would want to go, you know, I was, I'd love, I'd love to go places to do research. I did it for my second book in Italy. And my third book, actually. But finally, it was time that we could go. And Bonnie's like, it's open. Berlin is open. Like the day, the moment it opened, she let me know, you know. And so we had been already researching, obviously, the things that we wanted to look up if we went to Berlin. And one of those things was the Romanish Cafe, which is where uh, Billy Wilder used to hang out. And so I had already done some research and I had emailed the expert on the Romanish Cafe, basically, this woman. And I said, you know, we're coming to Berlin in a few weeks. Can I meet with you? Every subject in the book has an expert attached to it that we yeah. spoke to. Every single one. And the Romanish Cafe is just a perfect example. We literally found the expert. Um, but, but there was nothing. I mean, Jerry and Joe, there are a lot of experts about them. There's a lot of experts about comics, obviously. Also about, I mean, it was crazy. We just found people, wrote to them, and mostly people wrote back. Yeah. That is amazingly generous. I have two thoughts about that. Two questions. One is, how do you keep that together? Like, how do you keep that organized? There are so many threads running through this this book. And in truth, I didn't want to put it down because I didn't I didn't want to have to come back and figure out where I was. And it and it just it's so complete. And yet, there are so many threads woven through here. How did you keep it straight? And how did you know when you had enough for the book? Well, Bonnie just kept sending me stuff. And I, some days I would be like, Bonnie, stop. You need to stop. I was like drowning in information. I was like, Bonnie, stop. Just please stop. Stop right now. But um, she, there was so much good stuff. I mean, she would just get so excited about something. And she'd like send it to me. I was like, Bonnie, I can't even process what you sent me 10 minutes ago. You know, so she sent me. But just for example, like discovering the Nazi Titanic. What? <laughs> the Nazis made a version of Titanic and it was the most expensive movie for 40 years. How can we not put that in the book? There was a lot like that that kept coming up and Helene kept saying, stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she just, she would just throw stuff my way and she was the main researcher really. And um, I would basically have chapters. I, I kind of had an idea of how it was going to unfold. I didn't completely know, but I had some idea. And so whatever she sent me, I would just sort of put in that chapter you know i just throw that information in that chapter and if i could i'd write it a little bit but then come back to it eventually you know and so i was just definitely organizing it as she was sending it to me and then of course you move it around and you know you you massage it and make it into what it's going to be but and, and information changed i called relatives that i had never even heard of let alone relatives that i i just didn't know who they were and they gave us new information and then someone would you know, it just built and built and built. It was two solid years. Yeah, because we didn't do anything else during that time. It was during the pandemic, really, you know, and we just, I didn't have much else work, much other work. You know, I wasn't teaching really because everything was closed. So it was just her digging and tossing it to me and me organizing it. And the, the beautiful thing about the book is how the, the threads did sort of come together. And some threads we didn't even know existed, like the one, I don't want to give anything away, but there's a whole part where... um the comics industry kind of implodes, you know, in, in the fifties. Um, and one of the reasons is uh, these horror comics that come out and there's a murder trial connected to them. And this is a whole other, you know, it's in the, it's in there, right? It's a thread. You want to, how is this going to connect? But there's a lot of that where it's like this weird thing that happened, but is really relevant. We didn't throw anything in there that didn't impact other things in the story. Right. Right. Anything that didn't have something to do with the, the main thrust of the story and the characters went out the window. You know, I mean, this book could have been 19 times as long with all the stuff we found. But, you know, we only we only kept the things that were 
sort of relevant, you know, but it did go off on some tangents and stuff. And it's just fascinating how it all ties together. And, you know, Bonnie said this the other day, if you dig and dig and dig, you're going to find those things, those connections, you know, so those tie-ins. And that's what we did. And, you know, the way you have, uh, start and end with the, with the filming is really powerful too. And it was such a great opening image, not to give too much away, right, but of Jules going to get that footage, you know, having his camera and, and just looking around his street and, and, and taking stock of where he is and the way you paint that picture of New York for anybody who might not have it in their head, you know, and it's, it's such a beautiful thing, the way Marilyn, the way you've, by the time you've developed Marilyn as a character in this, in this narrative, you gotta love her, you know, it just, she is a mighty figure. And it's almost like she's inviting her onlookers to to enjoy being voluptuous, to enjoy life, and and Jules accepts that invitation, which is such a a, a theme in running running through the the book. Helene, when did when did you have a sense that, of how you were going to frame the narrative as the chapters were coming together? I mean, I think we we had started out with that beginning right from the beginning, you know, because when you write a book and you're pitching a book to sell a book. You have to have a, a proposal. And that was the first chapter of the proposal. You know, that was right from the beginning. You know, I kind of had that in my head that that was going to be the beginning. Because you don't, you kind of want to start the book somewhere kind of in the middle, you know, and then flash mm -hmm. back to the, in, in the next chapter, right? So we want to, you want to start at one of the most exciting spots. And obviously, <laughs> one of the most exciting spots is Jules being with Marilyn, you know. So we started there. We don't, we just give you a tiny little tease of it, right? But we also set up the rest of the story, right? The escape from Nazi Berlin and a little bit of Harry. And you're just teasing the reader because you want to entice them to buy the book, right? <laughs> you want them to read the rest of the book. So that was right from the beginning. We knew that was there. And I kind of knew it was going to end with her finding the footage, with Bonnie finding the footage, you know, because then it comes right back around, right? Um, so we had the two ends. It was just what to put in the middle. We found a few <laughs> things to put in the middle. <laughs> just a few. You still finding stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna have to part two. We're gonna have the second one, the sequel. You know, I yeah, I think so. And, I, and you know, and I think your readers talk about teasers should read this book if only to uh, find out about the connection between comic books and pornography. You know, I mean, totally. there are things you're just not waiting for. <laughs> you're not ready for them. Bam. You know, it's it's really interesting. And there's what you say about the American way and and the sort of the opportunism. And sometimes there's altruism in there, and sometimes there isn't. And sometimes people are very selfish. And I think, you know, I had a conversation with a colleague at work. I teach freshmen, high school freshmen. And so there's a lot to do with the hero's journey and knowing what a hero is. And we do definition arguments. What is a hero and who lives up to that definition? And we decided, um, as we do every year at this time, God, we put too much on the heroes, you know, that their ordinary people are doing heroic things. And it's enough to notice that without getting the label maker out or casting them into the, you know, the fiery depths or celebrating them up on the, on the pedestal, but to see what humanity drives that in people. And that's what comes through in, in the development of the characters in this amazing nonfiction book that, that reads like a novel. Yeah. I think that hero thing is important. You know, that's, I mean, and right from the beginning, that's one of the reasons, again, why, why Bonnie wanted to do the book is to talk about her grandfather. You know, it's kind of about Marilyn Monroe. It's kind of about Superman, but it's really about Jules. I mean, Jules is the main character. He's the one working through the whole narrative. You know, he's he's the one carrying you through this story and he's the everyman, but he's the everyman who's a little bit of a superhero himself. And and we like to say it's about superheroes with and without capes because we do have a real superhero in the book, but we also have one without a cape. And that's Opie. I mean, Jules. Opie, Grandpa. <laughs> in my family, they're Omi and Opie, my grandparents. And I still, like, who's right. Jules? <laughs> right. <laughs> I think the, the book, page 317 in there, they, I mean, that was a very emotional reading this book in, in a lot of different places. But um, he's giving his speech. And in, in his speech, he would thank God and remember those who never made it over to safety. He would tell the crowd to always keep their loved ones alive in their stories because it was only there that they survived. Whole villages had been murdered in a Holocaust with no one left to even remember their names. It's so powerful. And there you are doing that, honoring him through this text, through his stories. What, what, what was it like to see your grandpa 
take shape as a complete book. Oh, it's been incredible. I mean, he knew he lived an incredible life and he wanted me to make a movie about him. Eh, he got a book. <laughs> Maybe a movie. <laughs> it's coming. One day. But so he knew. I knew it. He knew it. And um, so it's always been in the back of my mind, like if I'm ever in a position where I can tell his story. And then when Trump came along and fascism and, you know, Nazis became words you heard every day. I mean, it felt a little more urgent. It felt a lot like 1933. There was a lot of hate in the air, which I had never experienced before. Like that's certainly a lot of anti-Semitism specifically, but just general hate. So that's really why we have to remind people of these stories and it's up to every generation to do it because we have to tell, I mean, kids in high school, you must know better than anyone. They might know who Anne Frank is and that might be the end of their knowledge of the Holocaust. So it's really important that we keep putting this stuff out there so generations after generation understands and knows and won't make the same mistake. Oh, absolutely. I think that's what resonated me while I was reading this, that, you know, it was no joke in Berlin at that time and nobody was coming for you, you know, and um, and I was actually thinking an interesting other tax is um, Eric Larson's book, Midnight in the Garden. You, you know, it's the same idea. Dowd could have been doing cartwheels and handsprings and nobody was seeing it, you know, and it's it's stunning how people with the capacity to do the right thing yeah. don't, you, you know, or, or don't hear it or don't see it or it isn't opportune. And I mean, the, just the brutality and the, the rapid transition uh, of the quality of their lives in Berlin that, that the book captures is so, um, it's so compelling. And it's, and it's so resonant with what we have going on here, <laughs> you know, and, it, and how it turns on a dime. Sorry, well, we're trying to keep it bay. That's what, you know, it's, right. it's not completely here, but it's around our fringes right now. Right, right, exactly. And then there, you know, there was that story of the Gestapo guy who warned my grandfather about Kristallnacht. I mean, he saw him as a human being he knew he was a Jew and that meant bad, but he also knew he was a human being and that, and he was kind to him where he totally didn't have to be. And that saved his life. Yeah. That, that was a crazy story too, because, you know, Bonnie had told me um, the whole time we were writing the book that they had escaped. They left Berlin the night, the night before Kristallnacht, you know? So, you know, we just assumed it was a coincidence. We didn't know why. And so, and so then one of the times we were interviewing her mother, maybe like the sixth time I think I talked to her mom, um, we were like, yeah, it's so crazy that they that you guys left the night before Kristallnacht. And she's like, oh, well, yeah, because of that Gestapo guy in our building who warned us. And Tani was like, what? You know, she had never heard that story before. I thought I knew everything. And then in through doing through years of doing this book, I just kept learning stuff. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. So, you know, p people in your family assume you know stories. Maybe she told your sister twice and never told you. You know what I mean? That's what my mother always says. Oh, I told your sister twice and forgot to tell you. So that was like a major puzzle piece in there. You know, why did they leave the day before Kristallnacht? Well, fascinating to think that Nazis were like, well, he's good. So I'll tell him. He, he can go. They were making those choices on an individual basis is crazy. Well, I think you also said at one point, it's easier to hate a group than to hate your the neighbor that you pass on the stairs every day, you know, which I actually included yeah. in the book. It keeps being proven in crimes in America too, that it's the anonymous group that's hated. The individual is less hated. Once you get to know someone, you can't hate them. Exactly. It doesn't. And then, and again, back to the power of the book, you've just created these real human beings that are just so accessible and, and, and real, you know, and, um, and just, I'm just curious, Bonnie, and maybe I'm nosy more than curious, but I'll, I'll ask, did, did Jules leave much of a written record of his own story? Did he journal or take notes or any of that kind of thing? No, but he was a public speaker. So I heard him tell the stories. And of course, he told them to us. We used to spend every Sunday with my grandparents. So, I mean, I knew him really well. So I, he, I was in my 40s when he died. So I was very lucky. Yeah, that's amazing. I wish, I wish he was still around. I wish I had actually met him. I feel like at this point that I have. But, you know, my grandfather tried to kill us when I was a kid. So it would be nice to have a nice grandfather. <laughs> that's book one. But, you know, Opie, I wish he was my grandpa. 
he would have left you, Helene. <laughs> I'm just just curious what is what is next for the two of you as far as a duo of researcher writers or promoters of the book what's what's in the future you mean next week or you mean like next year eh, both what's the, what are your plans for promoting the book and then and then beyond do you see do you see another piece of this story developing I mean there's any number of directions any piece of the book could take or I, I'm hoping it's going to become a movie or a film sure. or a TV show, you know, and it would be nice to be involved in that somehow. So, cause I've had stuff option before and then they ruin it. So it would be nice to actually have some input. So, and I know Bonnie would like that because it's her family story. Yeah. Opie wanted it to be called the signature, the movie to be called the signature. Cause he put, he, everything was about the signature for him. Getting the sponsor to come to America. Right. So, um, yeah, so we're promoting the we're, we have a few you know events in different places around the country and on podcasts and stuff like that. This is a pretty much a one shot for me. I wrote two books on design. I'm a graphic designer. I own my own company, so I'm back to doing what I do. What I would like to do next, actually, is and this has sort of piqued interest in it is um there's a story in our family on the Polish side of the family that we have a Jewish great grandfather. I'd like to go back to Poland soon, sooner rather than later to, to research that because I think the people who are still living, you know, might know more about it. And I feel like if I wait too long, they're not going to be around anymore. So I'm, I'm convinced that when I do go back, I'm going to find out that Bonnie and I are actually related. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's great. And um, it, it's an exciting book and we can't say enough about it up here in Woodbury and can't wait to see you guys at the Woodbury Library in a matter of weeks now. Very exciting. So thank you for your for your your time and talking to Woodbury Writes this this evening. Appreciate your your art, your effort, and everything you've done to make this an amazing story accessible to all of us. Thanks for reading it and getting it. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll see you soon, Sandy. See ya.